to be here and here with you today to figure out exactly what's going on when it comes to the federal budget. Uh, do me a favor, let me know if the stream's working okay and leave a comment right now, like the video so I can see that you're here. Uh, appreciate you all being here, okay. So we've got a little bit of context to build around what this budget is going to look like, what could be inside of it, what could not be. Some of the rumors that have come out since um, since the past over the past couple of days, as well as all of the number of items that uh, that have been sort of uh, pre-announced by the government this year. Okay, great to see you, everybody uh, tuning in. We've got Maria and Daryl and and Just Bina and Envy. Awesome. Uh, good to see you guys. Good to see you. All right. So, yes. Housing, 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 housing is one of the biggest priorities right now for this budget. Let me get off of this video page. Um, yeah, housing. This is where we think most of the announcements are going to be. And in fact, a lot of them have come out already. Some of them we talked about in the video yesterday, if you watched that on the channel. Um, some changes to um, the uh, length of mortgages, like the amortization of mortgages for some Canadians, uh, largely insured mortgages, first time home buyers, adds a little more demand to the market, but makes it easier for people to get in. Also, other changes that make it easier to get in, um, including a larger amount that you can withdraw from your RRSB if you're RRSP if you're buying a home for the first time. So lots of measures like that, lots of measures aimed at building more houses. But like we always say here on the channel, it's not a matter of what they announce, right? It's a matter of the details of what they announce, often which there aren't many details, and how likely we think it is that they'll be able to actually implement this. So this is what we're going to be questioning today. And um, we're expecting the budget, uh, the actual presentation of it to be going live here in the next 20 minutes or so, maybe just over 20 minutes. I've got on my screen here, let me show you. Uh, this is a live stream right now of the House of Commons I've got right here. So I've got this on my uh, other monitor. Um, so we can get a little more context, hear what people are saying, what some of the big concerns are about this budget before it starts. And uh, keep in mind that I've got this on my other monitor. And as soon as we get to the good stuff, um, well, <laughs> good could be a matter of opinion. Um, as soon as we get to that stuff, I'll flip over to that. Obviously, the biggest uh, sort of question mark here is the different tax changes, the, the tax updates that are going to have to come because it seems like there's just over $30 million worth of new spending here, yet the Liberal government has dedicated to not increasing the deficit. So where is that money going to come from? As a lot of people speculating that there could be the implementation of a wealth tax as well as a excess profits or windfall tax um, applied to to multiple other businesses because we already saw that be applied to certain banks and insurance companies earlier on. So uh, that's one thing I'm going to be keeping my eyes out for. What are these changes? What is the threshold for how much um, how much you got to make before they start <laughs> taking even more of your money back? Um, or is it a matter of assets? How much you like devils in the details. So we're going to be keeping an eye on that. Usually this budget comes out and then we get a big fat document, like a hundred, 150 page document to, to scroll through. So hopefully we'll be able to get our hands on that document while they're uh, announcing what's going to be inside of it um, in the live stream there. Uh, and then I'll be able to find some key points in there. We'll take a, uh, a look at some of the highlights and then over the coming week or so, I'll make some videos on some of the most impactful stuff that I think is in there. But for now, one of the most controversial videos that came out just yesterday, and this is uh, David Dodge, uh, who was the former Bank of Canada governor. Um, you know, Tiff Macklem, that's the current governor of the Bank of Canada. Now, before him was Stephen Polos, and then before him was David Dodge. Um, and so he has some very strong words to say about what he expects to be in this budget, um, saying that he thinks it's going to be rather disappointing and maybe, well, like, look at this headline here likely to be the worst in years. Now, I, I saw this last night, but didn't watch it. I thought, hey, this is going to be a good one um, to, to take a listen to. So let, let's dive into this um, and let me know um, that you can hear this. But also, um, with about 350 people here in the stream so far as we get set to start this uh, viewing party of the budget, let me know where you're tuning in from. I love to get an idea of all the different cities, all the different provinces that people are tuning in from. That's what we like to do here on the stream. So while we watch this video, let me know where you're tuning in from, what you're up to, maybe what you're drinking today. I'm, I'm not on the hard stuff yet, just coffee right now, but maybe there's some of you that have uh, already started for the evening. So <laughs> let me know. But uh, for now, let's take a look at this. Debate in the House of Commons today ahead of the federal government.
government's that budget set to be delivered in fewer than 24 hours. But in an unusual pre-budget twist, we already know a lot of what will be in it after a multi-week pre-budget blitz. The government has already previewed almost $40 billion in spending, about half of which is set to be loans. Despite all that new spending, Finance Minister Christia Freeland is insisting she will stand by the fiscal anchors outlined in her fall economic statement. There are three of them, keeping the 2023-24 deficit below $40.1 billion, reducing both the debt-to-GDP ratio and then also the deficit-to-GDP ratio in 2024. So that's going to be pretty interesting, right? These are what they call fiscal anchors for the budget. This is what the Liberal government is saying, hey, even though we're, we might be taking on debt, as long as these numbers are, um, are changing in the right direction, we're still okay. They've been really anchored on that debt to GDP ratio. Basically, okay, if we take on more debt, but our economy is growing faster than the amount of debt we take on, then we should be good. That's the thought around that number. Now, the big question mark there is how um, the population growth has impacted GDP. And many people, myself included, think that using GDP per capita, GDP per person, uh, otherwise, the, like the, um, it, it, how, how do I best explain this? Yeah, GDP per person is a better measure of actually how things are going for the individual people in the economy, rather than just looking at the economy as a whole, because you can just add a million people to the country in a year. And of course, your product or the amount of things that you produce, the amount of sales that happen are going to go up, and it's going to make your economy look better, even if it doesn't actually serve the individuals. 25 and keeping deficits to 1% of GDP by 2026-27. So how might Freeland walk the line of spending without ballooning Canada's deficit? Joining us now to talk about that is former Bank of Canada Governor David Dodge. Mr. Dodge, good to see you. Thanks for making the time. Hi, Massey. How inevitable, in your view, after what you've seen announced so far, are new taxes? Something doesn't add up. Uh, so I think there's a big question of how much of all that promised spending is going to be booked into this year and next year, uh, and how much is going to be deferred out, out the back end. Uh, I think that's a real question we'll be looking for. Uh, secondly, uh, well, maybe she promised to keep the deficit under $40 billion. Maybe that just won't happen. And then finally, uh, finally, I think there is a very real possibility that they'll do exactly the wrong thing and tax the very uh, folks and the very corporations uh, that are going to make the investment that will actually raise income over time. That's an interesting point, right? Now, now tell me what you think of this, because some people will say, oh, that's convenient speak for the wealthy elite to, to make this claim in Canada. Um, but some people will see some validity in this. Let me know what you think. His point here is that, okay, well, we've got all this spending. we got to get that money back somehow in order to pay for it, especially because she's say, saying that we're not taking on debt right now as a country. Um, uh, probably a good idea not to take on a ton more debt as a country, given how, the, how high interest rates are relative to the past 10 years. Should have maybe even taken on more debt when rates were so low and locked those in for longer terms. But I digress. He's saying, well, someone's going to have to pay for that. We should, and it seems like the, uh, the, the, the elephant is the, in the room is that, hey, we're going to tax corporations more and we're going to tax uh, the Canada's highest earners more. Um, that sounds good to a lot of people, right? Okay, well, like uh, they've got as much as they need and then some, so they should be able to contribute to help society a little bit. But then on the flip side, we have a big GDP per capita issue, a big productivity issue in this country. And if we heavily tax um, the wealthy individuals who might start businesses, who might invest in businesses, as well as those businesses themselves, then does that really allow us to invest in order to increase our productivity and uh, as a result, increase our GDP per capita and the average quality of life for Canadians? That that's the big question. I, I'm curious what you think about that because uh, some people will say, "Oh, that's a, kind of a load of bullshit," and and some people will say, "Actually, that makes a little bit of sense." Okay, let's parse apart the last point that you just made because Minister Freeland has been explicit that she won't grow the size of the deficit. So I think that is what has prompted all the speculation around taxation. The only thing she ruled out, and the Prime Minister has done so as well, is any new taxes on the middle class, which is what I think you're pointing to, the concept of either a wealth tax and or some sort of excess profit tax on the corporate side. Those seem to be the two 
most speculated about. Why, in your view, uh, are those the wrong thing to do, particularly when I think the communication around them both, uh, you know, might be popular with Canadians? Oh, I'm sure it's popular. No one ever likes taxes <laughs> uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's the old adage, uh, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the fellow behind the tree. And, and <laughs> unfortunately, uh, there is no one behind the, the tree. Person uh, behind the tree is us, and she's going to tax us. Uh, if, if, indeed, she is going to keep to the spending numbers, uh, which she uh, has promised, and if she's going to keep to the budget deficit. So the right thing to do, because the problem at the moment is we're not investing enough, we're consuming too much, would be the tax consumption. That she's sworn she won't do. And so what she's going to try to do is to do something that will slow down the very investment, which is going to raise Canadian standard of living uh, over time by uh, taxing at the margin uh, 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 the corporations and the individuals that are going to make the investments that will help grow the economy. Yeah, this is the thing that, that I wonder as well. Like, I, I kind of get that point. Like, like I, I wonder if it would be better to f find that money, find that spending that we need for this in, in reductions in government spending as it is, right? We've seen the public service absolutely balloon over the past decade. The, the, the cost of paying for government operations, the, the bloat and bureaucracy, like that's where I feel like it's like, okay, do we really need all of all of these sort of middle management administrators all throughout every single level of the government to, to pass things through when we have um, perhaps a lot better tech that we could be using that could uh, take take away a lot of those jobs that we as taxpayers pay for. Like, I feel like that may be the better thing, whereas it seems like, okay, um, the, the thoughts right now are, well, let's keep our government bloat. Let's keep the, the large amount of uh, bureaucracy and pay for all these jobs and all these pensions over the years. Um, and we'll have to raise taxes on wealthy Canadians and corporations in order to pay for that, um, in, in order for us also to implement whatever social programs we want to implement and hopefully will help us get elected. How are you sure, how can you be sure that that will slow, I think what I interpret from what you're saying is that will slow economic growth. Uh, why? It, it, it will slow economic growth o over the medium term. And why precisely is it? Because what we need to do is to raise the amount of capital per worker so that we can raise the productivity of individual workers. That's the only way we're going to raise incomes of Canadians over time. Um, and you cannot get there simply by saying, well, we're going to ask Canadians to spend more now. Uh, that will not raise the incomes in the future. In fact, that will condemn us forever and ever to what Canadians feel at the moment, the fact that there has been no real growth in the economy for the past 10 years because we have not made investments in the equipment and the intellectual capital that workers need. Surprisingly, uh, Vasi, we in Canada have overinvested compared to every other country, compared to the United States, compared to Australia. Uh, we have overinvested in, in housing, a far too large share, a large share of our national uh, income. Uh, and a large share of our savings has gone to housing with the effect that too little has gone to machinery, equipment, and intellectual capital for workers to work with. I'd agree with that in a big way. It feels like uh, like the reinforcement time and time again by the government that real estate is where you should put your money. And we'll talk about some of the policies that are coming out today that I think do the same. Because of that, I feel like so many people put their money there and that's the retirement fund. And there's not really the incentive to risk that kind of capital to start a business or to try to like um, create something for yourself, create something that could uh, be a, a company that could employ even more Canadians. Um, very interesting stuff. I'm going to get back to that. If you're just tuning in, just 
joining us. We're expecting uh, Christopher Freeland and the federal government to release their um, 2024 federal budget for the year. This happens only once per year, and it tells us, hey, where's the government planning on spending all their money over the next year, uh, including updates from f former um, sort of fall economic updates, things like that. Um, on my other monitor here, I'm monitoring, um, no pun intended, monitor and monitoring, um, what's actually happening in the House of Commons right now. We're expecting uh, 4 p.m. to be the crisp start time of that um, of that budget speech that Freeland's going to give, as well as the release of the documents that has all of the details for what they're talking about here. If there is going to be this wealth tax and this corporation tax added and who that's actually going to apply to, because there's no real clarification on what they see as wealthy Canadians um, more and more. So it seems like the, the middle class incomes um, are re in reality, you need a lot higher than what people think is a middle class income to be in the middle class these days. So who knows if the government will take that into account or not. We're going to be keeping an eye on it here over the, um, the next uh, couple of hours as this actually all rolls out. So I've got that here on my other monitor um, and I'm gonna make sure to bring that over and we're gonna switch over to that as soon as we can, as soon as that starts. Um, for now, we're building context, what people hate about what's been announced so far and maybe some of the good as well. And I appreciate you all tuning in and, and joining me in the chat. Say hey if you haven't before. Uh, it's so nice to recognize a lot of these names from people who have commented on the videos and have been here in previous uh, in previous lives as well. We've got Brian and Urge and, um, and Fear and Woo William and, and Flying Iguana. I like that one, Sheridan, uh, good stuff. I, I do take your point, Mr. Dodge, on the lack of investment on the business side, but I think to play devil's advocate for a second, if the government didn't, uh, you know, in, I don't know if the right word is invest, but didn't address in some capacity the issues around housing, there would be protests in the streets at this point. Like I, I can recall a year ago when they were saying, well, it's not really our jurisdiction and the, the blowback was fierce and, and, and it was fast. Well, the way to address it is to increase saving, is to increase saving, but we're moving in exactly in the wrong direction, Bessie. This, uh, you know, I was saying to someone earlier, I think this is likely to be the worst budget since the McKechnie budget of 1982 in the sense of pointing us in the wrong direction uh, as to how we go about raising the incomes of Canadians and actually making Canadians feel better uh, over the medium term. In layman's terms, though, Mr. Dodge, what does, I mean, why is addressing the, the supply side of housing you think going in the wrong direction? Like when you say saving would be a better approach, what, what does that mean to the average Canadian? How do you explain that? Uh, what, 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 so uh, addressing the supply side of housing by removing some of the imperfections in markets that prevent markets from working properly uh, to make proper use of the uh, of the investments that are available for housing, that 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 is fine. But by adding to the demand, further adding to the demand for housing uh, that the government is planning to do, uh, it is not going to solve the problem. This was one of the points that I made in the. Oh, yes, you can hear me. Okay, good. I got, I'm always toggling the mute. Yeah, one of the points that I made in the video that just went out yesterday is, okay, there's a, a housing plan that's come out just in advance of this budget, and they're saying, hey, check this out. Housing is a priority for us. We're serious about it. One of the things that concerns me inside of it, though, even though they are addressing the supply side, um, billions and billions and billions of dollars um, to, uh, to incentivize people to develop and build more homes um, and um, more, especially purpose-built rental units, um, lots of incentives in there. I think that's a good thing. Uh, one thing that's uh, a little bit curious to me is some of the help for home, bu home buyers, some of the things to make it easier for people to buy a home, and some of the things that are uh, like overtly meant to protect current homeowners. Right, we saw um, the addition of 30-year amortizations for um, first-time home buyers who are getting insured mortgages. Um, that's under a 20% down payment. Many first-time home buyers can't save up the full 200k uh, uh, or the 20 20% 20 for 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 um, a full down payment there without mortgage insurance. They're making it easier for people to qualify for that type of mortgage, um, uh, allowing more people to get into the market. 
a good thing for those people who are right on the edge of being able to purchase a home, but I think it's going to increase demand in the market, right? Whenever you help people get in, be it through the first time home uh, savings account or um, increasing the amount that people can withdraw from their RRSP to put towards a down payment, I feel like that that adds demand into the market. And it's kind of like a short term, like, hey, this is nice for a few people right now, but then those people enter the market and the marginal demand goes up and like, is it really all that good in the long run? And, and on the flip side, uh, the one thing that has been um, s- stopping housing prices from going down over the past couple of years are amortization extensions being allowed by the bank. Um, people at, at renewal time saying, hey, I can't afford to to pay this much each month. And then the banks are like, hey, we don't really want to foreclose on you. So we're going to allow you to stretch out your mortgage to be 40 years, 45 years to make your monthly payment lower. Um, even though you're going to pay us more interest in the long run, uh, your short-term cash flow problems will be solved as a result of this. That means that a lot fewer people have had to sell their properties because they're able to get these sort of um, th- this sort of aid uh, from uh yeah, from from the government's policies that are allowing this to happen. And, and a quick thank you to Corey Ash. Amazing. Thank you so much for the super chat. Real economic karma. Yeah, I think so, Corey. I think so. I'm going to hit like on that one. Um, yeah, so interesting stuff here. Let, let's see what else is continuing here. Just one more question for you, Mr. Dodge, because we've talked about sort of the intersection between fiscal policy and monetary policy before. We've seen a number of provinces table budget uh, deficits rather that were much larger than anticipated in Ontario and in uh, British Columbia as well. Uh, The government here is talking about how in the medium to long term, the investments on the supply side will prove not to be inflationary. But in the short term, if you combine those provincial deficits with whatever the federal one, we know it's going to be there in some form or, or another, whatever that is. Uh, what Do you think that applies a tangible amount of pressure on the Bank of Canada at this juncture ahead of their next announcement? Uh, yes, um, but but it's the aggregate of demand that, that does it. It's not, not necessarily the very, very specific items. And what we've got uh, at the moment is governments are going out and borrowing, uh, borrowing more which would not necessarily be a, a terrible thing at all uh, if the, that borrowing was uh, being invested in physical and intellectual capital per worker so that productivity would go up so that our national income would go up. So we would actually be producing more in this country, not, uh, not con- consuming more. It's very hard for all of us uh, now to, uh, to accept the fact that for the last decade, our standard of living has been going down because we have not been investing. People think this is because of inflation and the, the costs are going up. The, the fact is that we have not been producing enough to meet the demands that we are putting on the economy. And that's the problem that Mr. Macklem has to deal with. Uh, He can only do so much. Much of it has to be done through fiscal policy. And fiscal policy, unfortunately, uh, at this juncture, is moving in the direction uh, that will not increase our output. Uh, In fact, what it will do uh, certainly will not increase our output per capita. Uh, uh, What it will do is condemn us uh, as we go forward to the very bad, lackluster uh, uh, situation we've had uh, since the great financial crisis. It's not all due to this government, um, but since the great financial crisis, we in Canada have been falling behind. And- and that, that's something that we see, yeah, when we look at GDP per capita, and especially real GDP per capita, taking into consideration inflation also, also on that. Um, so if you're just joining me, I know there's a couple a couple hundred more people who have joined since the last time I said this. We're expecting the federal budget to come up here in just the next 
yeah, in six minutes is what it's scheduled to come up. So I've got this, I'm monitoring it. This is the House of Commons live right now as we speak. And Christopher Freeland's gonna go up there and give her budget speech. We're gonna get the big fat budget document. I'm gonna be looking through that as we listen to the budget speech. And we're gonna hit on some highlights um, that I think are especially interesting. Um, one that is the inspiration for the title of this video is the new tax. Um, it seems like there's going to be a number of new taxes implemented and changes to existing taxes possibly, um, depending on what's inside this budget. The two most discussed ones though, um, being because Freeland said, hey, we're not gonna tax the middle class, even though she doesn't define what the middle class is. Um, we're not gonna tax the middle class, so it has people looking towards, hey, are there going to be big massive corporation taxes? What does that mean for job creation in the country and, and for our, um, our economic growth in the country? And as well, a wealth tax on individual Canadians. Now we don't know if that's tied to income or if that's tied to asset ownership. Uh, this is gonna be a, a big deal um, because it sort of sets the table for um, what's gonna happen in this country over the next year, especially going into the next election. Um, an interesting article came out yesterday talking about, hey, could this be part of the strategy is like going after um, Canada's wealthy and Canada's corporations um, as a strategy for the liberal government to try to make the conservatives go against that and say, hey, no, actually don't tax these wealthy Canadians for a number of different reasons, but also playing into the same sort of uh, framing of the Conservative Party is they just want to help wealthy elites. They, they don't care about average Canadians. That could be a possible election play. But we're going to uh, tune into this budget as it comes out. Uh, again, just a few minutes away now. I've got another video queued up here that I want to take a look at. And this is specifically talking about these new taxes. The uh, title of this video, Federal Budget to Include Tax Hike for Wealthiest Canadians. Um, this is from CBC Power and Politics. Of CBC programs, I find this to be the most evenly balanced um, but let's take a listen to this we're not going to listen to the whole thing of course but it's going to give us some more perspective on these new taxes the details that we could find in this budget and um, a, a host of other things as well uh, and I'll be uh, tuning in and uh, giving you my thoughts as we listen in details about what will be in tomorrow's federal budget okay <laughs> c'est parfait oui. merci beaucoup <laughs> Today, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christian Freeland continued the very Canadian tradition of selecting a new pair of shoes ahead of the budget. The annual spending plan is usually shrouded in secrecy, but the Liberal government spent the last couple of weeks rolling out the key planks largely related to housing. I'm joined now for more details by my colleagues, Radio Canada's Parliamentary Bureau Chief Louis Blouin and the CBC's Karina Roma. Good to see you both. Hey. Hi. So, Louis, uh, you guys have a story up this morning on Radio Canada about tax increases coming in this budget tomorrow. What are you hearing about that? We know that the big question tomorrow is the fiscal anchors that uh, the finance minister said last spring, could, uh, last fall, could she remain committed to that? We know that they have to bring in revenues. So what they are targeting is rich people in Canada. They want to tax some wealthy Canadians more. Uh, what we're told is that it's going to be a very small percentage of the Canadian population, less than the 1% that we are talking about. So, and it's not the first time that they've done that. You know, last year they raised uh, the minimum tax that limits the, the ad tax advantages you can get uh, when you, you file your, your tax return. So they could go that way. They could go the way of taxing more capital gains. That could be another option or maybe simply having a new uh, bracket of imposition. So we will see the details for that tomorrow. Uh, we are also hearing that the Liberals want to make some fiscal changes for big businesses in Canada right. uh, to bring in also more revenues. So could it go as far as what the NDP is asking, this, uh, excessive, this tax on excessive profits of oil companies, uh, big grocery chains in Canada? Uh, the signal that we receive is that they're not necessarily uh, ready to go there. But we will see as, well, how far they go because they have a balancing act to do there. They right. don't want to be counterproductive and, you know, just push away investment in Canada at a time where, you know, growth is kind of not what we hope for. So it's going to be a delicate exercise tomorrow, uh, what they're right. doing, but they want to send the signal that they want to bring in more money. Right. So after the weeks of, of the spending announcements, it's, it's targeting the 1% richest of Canadians in some form or another, either capital gains, stock options, yep. alternative minimum tax or a new tax bracket. We don't know which. Yep. And on the corporate side, something, but maybe not the windfall tax or a base increase. Yep. What about the digital services tax? Louis, this is something they want to bring in for the big tech companies. They've announced it, legislated it, but they've never put it into force. Exactly. Do we, do we know what's, what's <laughs> happening there? We asked, could it be that? Because we were wondering, because uh, this could be an option to get in more yep. revenues. What we, what we were told in the background is that 
it's already announced. Maybe we're right. going to get some details about how it's implemented, but uh, it's not the news we're looking for. Okay. So we'll see. All right. Interesting stuff about a digital service taxes. Not the most success in uh, going up against big tech and, and collecting money from them with all the news stuff. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Candace from Mountain Finance. I appreciate it. Gifting uh, one of the memberships to the channel to the Grime family. Great to see um, W's in the chat for Candace. That's, that's awesome. Thank you so much. All right, so Karina, uh, Louis talked about a balancing act that needs to be done here, you know, on the ledger between, you know, expenses and revenues, but also there's this balancing act the federal government has with the budget and how the Bank of Canada feels about this budget as they're trying to get to a sustainable low interest rate environment and not, and not cause any more rate hikes. Exactly. Everyone I've talked to has said they have to send a signal of fiscal responsibility. Now, perhaps fiscal responsibility and restraint is in the eye of the beholder, but the Bank of Canada is looking for, a, are we ready to start lowering rates? And they're only going to be ready to do that if, as Christian Freeland has said many times, they don't pour more fuel on the fire. Mm -hmm. So you've got all these spending announcements, although I, they say, you know, $38 billion, uh, that we've heard so far, but $17 billion of that being a loans program, so it's not you know, it's, it has to be taken into account. Still, it's a lot of money. Um, so will that be seen as restraint? What more will we see tomorrow? How will they pay for it? Uh, all of that. That's an interesting thing she's saying here that, well, the Bank of Canada can't, um, can't cut rates until inflation comes down. What I personally believe, maybe it's a little tinfoil hat, I think that a lot of people might think the same way as me, even if no one would say it, is that the Bank of Canada is very beholden to the Federal Reserve in the States. I don't think that they want to be seen as um, as taking a, a fork in the road away from the Federal Reserve. Um, that That's the sort of equivalent of the Bank of Canada in the States um, that has a lot more, uh, like... Uh, influence across the world and what they do. The problem is, um, if, if Canada lowers rates right now, it kind of devalues our currency relative to the U.S. dollar. Um, and uh, is, that, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, but the, the tricky thing is, the Federal Reserve right now in the States, well, they've just seen high inflation prints. They're seeing the economy uh, remaining strong in the states. So why would they cut rates? Rate, cutting rates is going to, uh, is like stimulus for the economy, help uh, help sort of grease the wheels of the economy. But they're having an economy that seems like it's too hot again. Um, partially, I think the reason for that, um, that we're seeing less of that economic uh, growth and um, uh, prosperity in Canada is because of just how much more influential the Bank of Canada is on Canadian citizens than the Federal Reserve is on American city citizens, largely because of our mortgage system. In the States, you, you get a mortgage, you lock it in for 30 years, you don't renew it every five years and get a different rate, you lock in that rate for the long term. Um, that means that even though the Federal Reserve did raise their rates quite a lot, it didn't trickle into Canadians and their spending and, and, and how much they're able to spend in the economy um, because because their rates were, were fixed over 30 years. Whereas in Canada, you got to renew every five years, maybe less, maybe two, three, four, um, depending on the type of mortgage that you get. Uh, so a lot of Canadians felt it a lot more quickly than I think they did in the States. So that puts us between a, a rock and a hard place right now, I think. Okay, and this just in, we've got the budget starting up here. Let me flip over to this live stream. We're going to cut it back just a minute here. And here we go. Uh, this is going to be really interesting. I'm going to get a uh, look at this, uh, at the full budget document here on my other screen, and hopefully we can find some uh, some key points in here. But let's see what the, let's see what's going to be in here. I'm keeping my eyes open for the details about the taxes, anything new on housing, although they've announced quite a lot. Um, yeah, those are the two key points that I'm going to be looking out for. Let's let's get into it. Yeah, Mickey, Lord help us. That's right. And 30 seconds left on the clock uh, when debate is to resume. Order. It being 4 p.m., the House will now proceed to the consideration of Ways and Means Proceedings Number 20 concerning the budget, budget presentation. Come, il est 16 heures. It being 4 p.m., the House will now proceed to the consideration of Ways and Means Proceedings Number 20 concerning the budget presentation. Mrs. Ms. Freeland, seconded by Mr. Boissonneau, moves that this House approve in, in general the budgetary policy of the government. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Monsieur le 
Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 83-1, I would like to table in both official languages the budget documents for 2024, including the notices of ways and means motions. These documents contain details of the various measures. Pursuant to Standing Order 83-2, I am requesting that an order of the day be designated for consideration of these motions. Okay. Mr. Speaker. We are acting today to ensure fairness for every generation. We are moving with purpose to help build more homes faster. We are making life cost less. We're driving the kind of economic growth that will ensure every generation of Canadians can reach their full potential. And we're making Canada's tax system more fair by ensuring that the very wealthiest pay their fair share. Okay. Looking at this document, it seems like there's going to be changes to capital gains tax exemptions. We're doing this That's because a, a fair chance to build a good middle class life, to do as well as your parents and grandparents, or better, has always been the promise of Canada. But today, millennial and Gen Z Canadians can get a good job. They can work hard. They can do everything their parents did and more. And too often, the reward remains out of reach. They look at their parents' lives and wonder, how will I ever be able to afford that? Hmm. The same anxiety haunts those of us who care about our younger generations, their parents and grandparents. What many parents have achieved for themselves, a degree of comfort and security, we want for our children and grandchildren. We want their hard work to be rewarded, as it has been for us. We want them to look forward to a future with a sense of anticipation, not angst. We have arrived at a pivotal moment for millennials and Gen Z. These Canadians have so much talent and potential. They need to see and believe that our country can work for them. Making the promise of Canada real for younger Canadians requires action from us, and that is what we are delivering. It begins with building more homes at a pace and scale not seen since after the Second World War. Over the past three weeks, we have shared with Canadians our new and ambitious plan to solve the housing crisis and to help ensure that Canadians, especially younger Canadians, are able to afford their rent or mortgage payments. We're investing to kickstart the construction of more rental apartments and more affordable housing across our country. We're topping up the Housing Accelerator Fund, which is doing exactly what we intended and exactly what Canada needs, cutting through red tape and breaking down zoning barriers. This innovative fund is at the vanguard of a housing revolution in Canada and is fast-tracking the creation of new homes. We're making the math work for builders by cutting federal taxes on new apartment construction, breaking down regulatory and zoning barriers, providing direct low-cost financing, and making more government land available for building. Dans un pays... In a country with winters as long and as cold as ours, we are scaling up innovative construction techniques. Like modular housing, 
to build homes year-round. Modular housing makes Canadian homes less expensive and the Canadian economy more productive. To support all this new housing, we are investing in the infrastructure communities need to grow and increasing the number of construction workers. By creating opportunities for apprentices and recognizing foreign credentials. We're making it easier for Canadian homeowners to add a basement suite or a laneway house so middle class Canadians can be part of the housing solution too. Mr. Speaker, our work to build more homes faster across our country is quite literally an exercise in nation building a true Team Canada effort. Together, we are putting into action a plan to build nearly 4 million homes by 2031 and to unlock the door to the middle class for more young Canadians. While we work urgently to increase the supply of housing, our government is taking action to bring relief to Canadians, especially younger Canadians, by making it more affordable to rent or to buy a new home. This starts with better protecting renters from steep rent increases and rent evictions. It also means making sure they get credit for their on-time rental payments. So they are in a better position to qualify for a mortgage, maybe even at a lower rate, when the time comes to buy their first home. I think that's okay, but I don't think it's going to be a problem. Most people can't qualify because of their income. For first-time buyers, we will be extending the maximum amortization period of a mortgage to 30 years mm -hmm. on new builds, mm -hmm. including condos. That means lower monthly payments and greater opportunity for young people to get those first keys of their own. More interest over Combined the with tax-free ways to save for first down payment through the tax-free first home savings account and the enhanced home buyer's plan, the longer amortization period will ensure more younger Canadians are able to afford that first home <laughs> and take that next big step into a prosperous middle class life. Mm -hmm. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, the second part. I think it's good that it's scoped to new builds, though, to a certain extent, like make it so that more homes are built. Inflation has an now for been it. back within the Bank of Canada's target range for three months in a row. Oh. That is good news for Canadians. But more is needed to help reduce the cost of living, to help younger Canadians gain ground. As a government, we've made transformative enhancements to Canada's social safety net. $10 a day childcare is already saving parents thousands of dollars a year and making it financially possible for more Canadians to choose to start a family of their own. Now we're making further investments, creating even more childcare spaces so more families can benefit and so more mothers don't have to choose between a career and a family. This is feminist social policy and it is smart economic policy too. Already, thanks to our early learning and childcare investments, Canada has reached a record high 
for working age women's labor force participation. Bravo. Enrollment started in our new Canadian dental care plan in December. And more than 1.7 million Canadians have already signed up. Mm. <laughs> Next year, 9 million uninsured Canadians will have dental coverage. And we've introduced legislation to deliver the first phase of national pharmacare which will provide universal coverage for many diabetes medications and make contraceptives free, ensuring every Canadian woman can freely choose the contraceptive that works best for her, not just the only one she can afford. Okay. Mr. Speaker, free contraceptives are central to a woman's right to control her own body. That is a fundamental woman's right. It is a fundamental human right. Bravo. As a woman, as a mother, and as Canada's Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, let me say clearly here today, this is an essential right our government will always protect. Other countries, our friends, our neighbors, are losing their right to control their own bodies. We will not let that happen here in Canada. Our government's transformative investments are having a meaningful impact, helping every generation save money. The Canada Child Benefit is the foundation of our support to young Canadian families and has helped lift more than 650,000 children out of poverty since 2016. The Canada Workers' Benefit provides a meaningful boost to our lowest paid and often most essential workers. Our new Canada Disability Benefit will increase the financial well-being of low-income Canadians with disabilities. Bravo. That passed the House of Commons like a year ago, and it's just been in ongoing consultations for years and years with no details about how it'll be implemented or when. Working with provinces and territories We will expand access to school food programs and help 400,000 more children. Yes. <laughs> so that they can have good, healthy food that will allow them to have a fair start at a good, healthy life. La liste. The list of supportive cost-saving measures goes on, Mr. Speaker. The GST credit arrives every three months to put some extra money in the pockets of millions of Canadians. La the Canada Carbon Rebate ensures that we fight climate change in the most 
cost-effective way. Delivering hundreds of dollars to Canadians every three months, including yesterday. Eight out of ten Canadians get back more than they pay in the provinces where the federal price on pollution applies. And in this budget, we are delivering on our promise to return carbon pricing proceeds to small and medium-sized businesses. proud to announce that our new Canada carbon rebate for small businesses will soon return over $2.5 billion directly. That's right, over $2.5 billion directly to about 600,000 small and medium-sized businesses. This real meaningful support is a testament to our commitment to Canada's small businesses. Mr. Speaker, at a time when prices are high, we're delivering real investments that help make life cost less for Canadians. The third part of our plan is growing the economy in a way that's shared by everyone. To drive the kind of growth Canada needs today, we are redoubling our efforts to attract investment, increase productivity, and boost innovation. We're working to empower our best entrepreneurs to put their ideas to work here in Canada and create good paying and meaningful jobs. How do we do that? Well, to quote one of our country's great philosophers, we need to skate to where the puck is going. <laughs> That means doubling down on artificial intelligence. We were the first country to have a national artificial intelligence strategy. Over the past several years, we've supported the creation and growth of one of the world's leading, most talented Artificial intelligence. The problem is we don't end up keeping our intellectual property on our AI research. We are equipping our AI innovators with the compute power they need to attract and nurture the best researchers, scale up businesses and drive the innovation that will deliver transformative economic opportunities for Canada and Canadians. Homegrown Canadian AI companies are already helping to boost the productivity of Canadian workers. A natural area to seize a further competitive advantage for Canada is building the mechanical heart of the AI economy, data centers. We have a natural edge we have abundant and clean electricity. We have skilled and experienced engineers. We have the cold climate needed to help cool supercomputers. <laughs> and we are physically close to the world's largest market, which has vast data processing needs. We're introducing the accelerated capital cost allowance for innovation enabling and productivity enhancing assets. This means that investments in things like computers, data network infrastructure, and more will be eligible for immediate write-offs. This will encourage companies to reinvest, create more jobs, and make their businesses more productive and innovative. That's very good. Mr. Speaker, in the first three quarters of 2023, Canada attracted the very highest per capita foreign direct investment in the G7. Bravo. And the third most total FDI in the world. 
Our budget builds on that significant accomplishment because attracting investment is key to driving growth, increasing productivity, and boosting innovation. Mm -hmm. With the Canada Growth Fund and our $93 billion suite of investment tax credits, we are already encouraging businesses to invest in emerging clean technologies that can drive growth and productivity and create more good paying jobs. Today, we're proposing a new <coughs> investment tax credit to attract companies investing across the electric vehicle supply chain. Canada boasts an abundance so of natural you. resources. We intend to leverage this national advantage to build entire supply chains. And our new investment tax credit will encourage precisely that. We're investing over $5 billion in Canadian brain power. More funding for research and scholarships will help Canada attract the next generation of game-changing thinkers pursuing excellence. Very good. Very good. I don't know, it all seems to me like they just like will lean into things that sound good to the majority of Canadians to get brownie points rather than areas that we actually might be able to be competitive in. And interest free loans. That's my hot take. The amount of financial aid students get for housing and making it easier for mature students to go back to school affordably. And all of this is on top of our campaign promise to eliminate interest on Canada student loans which we delivered on a year ago. Our new Canadian Entrepreneurs Incentive will ensure entrepreneurs get to keep a bigger share of the profits from the risks they take and the hard work they do. And... This have more one. money I to like reinvest that. into their next I like venture. That. Anything that incentivizes Cost Canadians to take more risk with creation of businesses, I think, is a good thing. Depend on Canada's innovators, entrepreneurs, and researchers. And this is why we are supporting them. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, there are those who claim that the only good thing government can do when it comes to economic growth is to get out of the way. That's why you sit there, guys. That's why you sit there. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would like to introduce those people, those people who just cheered, to the town trades people and the brilliant engineers who last Thursday made the final weld. It's known as the Golden Weld on a great national project, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Yep. Liberal government to get it built. And last week, the Bank of Canada estimated that this project alone will add one quarter of percentage point to Canada's wow. GDP. It's almost like leaning into our natural resources and utilizing that as a good thing. <laughs> Invest with purpose for the benefit of our younger generations and those who love them. We continue to stick to a responsible fiscal plan. As part of that plan, in the fall, we set three very specific 
specific fiscal guideposts. Maintaining the 2023-24 deficit at or below $40.1 billion. Lowering the debt to GDP ratio in 2024-25 relative to the 2023 fall economic statement and keeping it on a declining track thereafter and maintaining a declining deficit to GDP ratio in 2024-25 and keeping deficits below 1% of GDP in 2026-27 and future years. Mr. Speaker, in this budget, every single one of these objectives is being met. Oh, yes. is our fiscal anchor, a declining federal debt to GDP ratio over the medium term. In fact, Canada has the lowest deficit and net debt to GDP ratios in the G7, as recognized in our AAA credit rating. Yeah. And private sector forecasters are now predicting a soft landing for the Canadian economy, thus avoiding the recession and heartbreaking surge in unemployment that many had thought was inevitable. Canadians know how important it is to responsibly manage a budget in the face of rising costs. And they rightly expect their government to do the same. That's why, going forward, federal public service organizations will be required to cover a portion of increased operating costs through their existing resources. Most of these savings will be achieved through natural attrition in the federal public service. As a result, over the next four years, we expect the ranks of the public service to decline by approximately 5,000 full-time equivalent positions. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Mr. Speaker, Reduction of bloat. to responsibly build happens. a fairer future for younger Canadians, we need to make sure our tax system is fairer too. In Canada and around the world, the 21st century winner-takes-all economy is making those at the very top richer, while too many middle-class Canadians are struggling just to avoid falling behind. The job of our tax system is to lean against this structural inequality, to fund investments in the middle class especially in young Canadians, by asking those who are benefiting from the winner-takes-all economy to pay a little bit more. Today, our tax system doesn't do that. Today, it is possible for a nurse or a carpenter to pay tax at a higher marginal rate than a multi-millionaire. That's not fair. That must change and it will. Our, go Our government is raising the inclusion rate to two-thirds on annual capital gains above $250,000 for individuals. So this new revenue will help make life cost less for millions of Canadians, particularly millennials and Gen Z. It will help fund our efforts to turbocharge the building of more homes. It will support investments in growth and productivity that will pay dividends for years to come. So, who will pay more? Well, Mr. Speaker, most Canadians have no capital gains in a typical year, so they won't pay more. The first $250,000 in capital gains every single year enjoyed by each individual Canadian will be taxed at the current rate. 
individual Canadians enjoying this substantial annual gain won't pay a penny more. The lifetime capital gains exemption, an amount fully exempt from taxation, will be raised to $1.25 million. And this change will not, of course, apply to the sale of Canadians' principal residence, which is and will remain fully exempt from the tax on That's good, I think. Only 0.13% of Canadians with an average annual income of $1.4 million will pay more on their capital gains. For 99.87% of Canadians, personal income taxes on capital gains will not increase. Taxing capital gains is not an inherently partisan idea. It is an idea that everyone who cares about fairness should support. In fact, the idea of taxing capital gains in Canada was first broached by the government of Prime Minister John Diefenbaker and his Royal Commission on <coughs> Taxation, chaired by Kenneth Carter. And Prime Minister Brian Mulroney raised the capital gains inclusion rate to 75%, higher than the rate we're establishing today. Yet, I know, there will be many voices raised in protest. No one likes paying more tax, even, or perhaps particularly, those who can afford it the most. But before they complain too bitterly, I'd like to ask Canada's 1%, Canada's 0.1%, to consider this. What kind of country do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a country where you can tell the size of someone's paycheck by their smile? Do you want to live in a country where kids go to school hungry? Do you want to live in a country where a teenage girl gets pregnant because she doesn't have the money to buy birth control? Do you want to live in a country where the only young Canadians who can buy their own homes are those with parents who can help with the down payment? Do you want to live in a country where we make the investments we need in health care, in housing, in old age pensions, but we lack the political will to pay for them and choose instead to pass a ballooning debt on to our children? Do you want to live in a country where those at the very top live lives of luxury, but must do so in gated communities behind ever higher fences using private health care and private planes because the public sphere is so degraded and the wrath of the vast majority of their less privileged compatriots burns so hot. Every one of us here in this chamber today and every Canadian across our truly great country needs to ask themselves these same questions because the stakes could not be higher. Democracy is not inevitable. It has succeeded and succeeds because it has delivered a good life for the middle class. When liberal democracy fails to deliver on that most fundamental social contract, we should not be surprised if the middle class loses faith in democracy itself. Tax policy is not only, or chiefly, the province of accountants or economists. It belongs to all of us, because it is how we decide what kind of a country we want to live in and what kind of a country we want to build. Today, our government is making our choice. 
C'est le chemin que nous... This is the path we must follow, Mr. Speaker. This is our plan to renew the promise of Canada. There are some in this chamber, particularly across the aisle, who do not share our vision. They would cut programs that we have put in place to improve the lives of all Canadians. Now comes the look at all the things we're paying for and doing, so you've got to vote government, for us. Kind of speech. Their opinion should just do a little and then less, and ultimately, in their view, do as little as possible or even nothing at all. They ripped up early learning and childcare. And as housing minister, the current leader of the opposition only got a handful of homes constructed. It was our prime minister, not a conservative, who actually got a pipeline built. And you know why that is, Mr. Speaker? That is because our government understands that to do big things in Canada, sometimes the government needs to lead the charge, whether it is getting more homes built faster or finally creating a national system of early learning and childcare or bending the curve on emissions. Let's be honest about what austerity and shrinking the state would mean for Canadians. It means you're on your own. It means no one will give you a hand when you falter and that you are choosing to turn your back on the friend or neighbour who has not been as lucky as you. That is not the Canadian way. In this country, we take care of each other. Wow, could that be it for the speech? A lot in this budget that we're going to do a little review of very soon. To make a positive difference in people's lives. To get big things built. To get big things done. You need more than a slogan. More than a rhyme or two. You can't hop on pop your way to a better country. To make a difference in people's lives, you need a plan. Canada needs action, not indifference. We are acting. The times call for building up our country, not sitting on the sidelines. We are building. Today, we say to our younger generation and to those who care about them, we are putting all the power of government to work for you. We will build more homes. We will make life cost less. We will grow our economy in a way that works for everyone. Together, we will unlock the door to the middle class for more Canadians and renew the promise of our great country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, so there's the budget. We're going to listen to the first immediate comments of Pierre Polyev, and then we're going to go into our own analysis. Some of the uh, uh, biggest changes here, one, a change to the capital gains inclusion rate for certain Canadians who are selling assets that uh, gain them um, quite a substantial chunk of money in a single year, largely... Uh, this could have an impact on rental stock um, for housing. We'll talk about that in just a second after we listen in to the Conservative leader's thoughts. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This is the ninth deficitary budget since the Prime Minister promised that the books would balance themselves and everything he's spending on has gotten worse he promised that the deficits would make housing affordable, but it ended up doubling the cost of rent and mortgage payments. 
and down payments to buy a house. He said that the cost of food would be more affordable, and now it costs 30% more, and one in four children aren't able to get nutritious meals. After nine deficits, Mr. Speaker, the government is rich and the people are poor. And today, they're doing the same thing over again with $40 billion worth of inflationary deficit. That means $2,400 for each family in inflation and spending and uh, increase to the national debt instead of health. And that's why the Conservatives have a common sense plan to put an end to this pyro prime minister who's adding fuel to the flames. Ninth deficit. The ninth deficit after the prime minister promised the budget would balance itself. And what did he do with the money? Everything he spent on has become more expensive. He's doubled the rent, doubled mortgage payments, doubled the needed down payment for a home, forced 35 homeless encampments in Halifax alone. One in four kids cannot afford food. And now he's adding $40 billion of new debt and new spending. That's $2,400 of new inflation. That is why Conservatives will vote against this wasteful inflationary budget that poor, that is like a pyromaniac spraying gas on the inflationary fire that he lit. It is getting too hot and too expensive for Canadians, and that's why we need a carbon tax election to replace him with a common-sense Conservative government. Thank you. Okay, so there's Pierre Polyev. Like, I... Not a lot of reaction to what was actually in the budget more of the talking of the, the same sort of points that he's been uh, that he's been talking about um, we were there's a back and forth here between Freeland and Polyev coming up but I don't think that there's a lot of very much value um, <laughs> in the back and forth as they both sort of go after each other and try to make each other look bad I think it would be good for us to take a look at some of the most impactful points from this budget because as we've been listening to this I've been going through the budget itself um, which is this 430-page PDF document. I'm going to keep this over here. That's the wrong page. I'm going to keep that there. I, I get, uh, let's go over some of these details because I think that you're going to find them pretty interesting. And I have some notes here. The biggest ones that we, we got um, information on was that capital gains tax. That's the biggest one. Remember they talked about, hey, there's going to be about $40 million worth of spending. Well... Now we need to figure out how we're going to pay for that. And they're going to be taxing wealthy Canadians. Um, and now we have the details on what those wealthy Canadians, um, who they are, and how they're going to be taxed. So let me find this page here. I believe it was page around 300. Let me go to capital gains. Um, let me search it here and see if I can find. Aha. Yes, I believe it is right in here. Three thirty-six, I believe, is where it starts the capital gains changes. Yeah. So, for those who don't know, quick recap: um, when you sell uh, any investment, this is the stocks or real estate that's not your primary investment, or or crypto, or even a business, um, you have to pay uh, tax on that sale as if it were um, income when it comes time for tax time. Now, there's an exemption rate on that capital gain. So, say I sold for a ten thousand dollar profit uh, an investment, uh, five thousand of that would be applied to my income at tax time, and then I would pay tax on that uh, at whatever my marginal rate is for that added income onto, onto my income. So that's how it works. Um, um, yes, uh, A1, you're right, unless you're in a registered account like a TFSA, RRSP, that type of stuff, um, it's, it's a, it works a little bit differently. Um, so what they're doing here is they're changing the percentage that you have to uh, add to your income from the profit that you make for certain Canadians. Now, I'm thinking that this won't apply to many Canadians on a yearly basis, but I think it will actually apply to a lot of Canadians at one specific time in their lives. Um, listen to this. Let me actually get up my annotation uh, a pen here, and we'll zoom in a little bit. Um, okay, perfect. 
So it says budget 2024 announces the government's intention to increase the inclusion rate on capital gains realized annually above $250,000. It was previously uh, one half and they're bumping it up to two thirds. So 66% of the profit um, on your the sale of your ca of your investment, 66% uh, of the profit is added to your income in the year that you sell it, and then you pay your marginal tax rate on that. Um, so that's a big deal, right? That's a lot more that gets added. But again, this is only above two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars for individuals. Um, if you're if you have a gain of less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in one single year, this isn't going to apply to you. It's still going to be the fifty percent. And if you're someone that invests in your TFSA, you're not going to have to think about this until you've maxed out your TFSA and you have um, unregistered investments and in just a, a typical investment account. But um, but, okay, there's one thing, very, very important thing about this, but we'll, we'll go on because uh, they also say here, um, all corporations and trusts that hold assets, um, wait, 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 where, from one half to two thirds. Oh yeah, okay, so for a corporation and trusts, there isn't this $250,000 limit. So people can't set up shell corporations to hold assets so that they can realize this in multiple, um, the, the, or, or get this sort of multiple times over the $250,000 exemption. Um, but all of it's gonna be bumped up for one half to two thirds, even below the $250,000 um, uh, exemption. So for a lot of Canadians, this $250,000, you're not gonna see that kind of capital gain in your life on a regular year. Um, but the, the thing that you might see it on is if you were to sell a rental property or a cottage or something like that for, for Canadians who, who have those assets. Of course, this isn't going to apply to your um, your primary residence. Uh, this is something that they made clear in the budget that, hey, you're selling your property. None of that gain gets added to your income at tax time. You're fully tax capital gains exempt in that situation. Um, but for rental properties or cottages, um, and and uh, and other assets, right? Where you could have a, a large gain like that, more of that is going to be taxed. So, again, like I said, I don't think that that's a huge, huge impact for average Canadians um, uh, in a single year, right? Uh, so, interesting. And they say I, I was reading here. They say that they project to make about um, uh, twenty billion dollars on this uh, on this change over the next four years. So about $5 billion a year from people who are, who are realizing these kinds of capital gains. Now, what I do think is that this could have a more of an impact on real estate and rental markets and rental properties, right? Um, when, when you think about a, a rental property owner, like I, we could see before this is implemented a whole bunch of rental properties getting sold right before this is implemented so that they can pocket more of their, uh, or have a higher um, exemption rate on their capital gains for their properties, right? That could happen. What I think is also, is possibly more likely is that people who own rental properties will be incentivized to never sell them, never put them on the market because of how heavily the capital gains on those types of properties are, are taxed if you're over that $250,000, right? You can't spread out your capital gains um, on a rental property sale over multiple years. It's going to get hit by this $250,000 if you've got, realized that much growth. So they could say, okay, instead of, uh, instead of selling this rental property, creating more uh, sort of sellers on the market, I'm just going to continue to hold this for the extreme long term. And to any extent I need additional money, I'll just use this as collateral and borrow um, borrow this money tax free, right? Because if you're not taxed on on any loans that you get, so if you take out a loan on one of these properties, well then, you can get all that uh, income or not income, but all of that money tax free. Uh, so they might just do that, use the house as collateral and not sell it. Does that mean that there will be less turnover in the rental market and the people who own it will own it for the long term and will spend it? Um, or we'll like pass it on to the next generation. That's what I'm curious about. But I think that this does effectively target the most wealthy Canadians. Um, but again, all the devils in the details, these are all only propositions, plans that the government is talking about doing. 
but how it actually is implemented is what is most important. So I'm, I'm withholding judgment on a lot of this stuff until we see um, see this kind of stuff. Yeah, Dimitri says, what if you have $250,000 plus capital gain tax from income property in 10 years, for instance? Yeah, um, for, for those rental property owners, they're going to have to, above that $250,000 gain, if they have that in a single year, they're going to have to pay this ha higher amount of it in tax for any gain above that $250,000. You don't get to spread it out over the total time you've owned the property. It's just the just in that one period. So that's quite interesting. Quite interesting. Okay, so more in here than just the changes on capital gains and how that could impact rental properties, rental prices, jump in listing before it's implemented or people holding it for the long term. Um, that was some of my thoughts. Uh, a good thing that I think I saw in here, um, we always talk on the channel about there's not enough incentives for Canadians to start their own businesses, grow their own businesses and, and, um, and profit from those businesses, right? Well, I think we should be doing as many things as we possibly can to incentivize people to, instead of just dropping all their money in real estate because they know that's going to be up only, um, to actually go out there, build their own business, and then be able to benefit from the sale of that business. Either it gets acquired by a larger company or you sell it to a different owner-operator. Um, you should be able to benefit from that. Um, so... Oh, one more question. Um, that Dowling guy, yes, it does impact uh, properties inside of a corporation, it seems, um, because there is any amount that you sell uh, of capital gains for, in those corporations are going to be taxed at 66% now instead of 50%. So that's pretty wild. I think it's going to impact a lot of rental property owners. Um, yeah, so th this benefit here for uh, entrepreneurs, a tax break for entrepreneurs, um, essentially what this is doing is allowing... Canadians who sell their businesses to keep more of those earnings, right? Keep more of those earnings. They're reducing the inclusion rate of the uh, of the gains of the capital gains on the sale of a proper or of a uh, business like this down to thirty three point three percent. So just as for individuals realizing gains uh, over two hundred fifty thousand dollars is increasing to two thirds, this is decreasing to one third from fifty percent. So. This means that Canadian entrepreneurs who sell their businesses or other businesses get acquired um, and they realize a significant profit from that, they're going to be able to keep more of that. Less will go to the government and they'll have that capital. Either maybe they'll retire and do nothing productive for the rest of their lives, but I think that a lot of people who create successful businesses end up moving on and starting a new one. So them having more capital generally tends to uh, be a, a benefit to uh, the country. At least that's the way that I see it with the information that I have. So I think this is a good thing. There's good things in here and there's bad things and there's areas that they haven't done enough, areas that maybe they're doing too much. Um, but we got to look at this from an unbiased lens and, and give credit where credit is due. I think it's important. And I like seeing like stuff like this from the liberal government. Um, I know a lot of people on this channel um, aren't fans of the liberal government, but I personally want them to be the strongest party they possibly can be. Um, even if you support the conservatives uh, vehemently, vehemently, is that how you say that word? Vehemently? Even if you are a diehard conservative supporter, you want the liberals to be as strong as possible so that the conservatives have to compete with them even more, even more heavily, right? Uh, competition between parties results in good things for individual citizens. You don't want one party extremely struggling because then the party in power or the party that's doing well doesn't have to do as much to to compete. So good stuff in here in, in some areas. Um, although here's one thing that I think is not good. One thing that is not good that is a result of extreme, extreme spending uh, being done by the government, uh, specifically in the early 2020s uh, during the pandemic because, hey, just like Canadians who have a mortgage have to refinance their mortgage and get new mortgages every five years, same goes for the debt that the government takes on. And uh, I hate to break it to you, but the government's going to be taking on this debt at a far higher interest rate. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, this is called Sources of Borrowing. It's in the budget's debt management Um section. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. So this is sort of talking about what's going to happen with Canada's debt. And 
they're saying that the amount of money that's going to be borrowed by the government in 2024-25 is projected to be 508 billion with a b dollars. 508 billion dollars is going to need to be borrowed by the Canadian government. Now this isn't paying for things that are happening right now, paying for new spending, right? This 508 billion dollars of debt that's being taken on is to they're taking on this debt so they can pay back their previous debt, right? Let me say that again. They're taking on $508 billion. Um, I think they said 83% of that $500 billion. I, when someone do the math there, I'm not sure what that is. But 83% of that $508 billion is not for new programs. It's to pay off previous debt. Taking on debt to pay off previous debt. That's what's happening here. Because when the government um, takes on debt, what they do is they issue bonds, like uh, Government of Canada bonds. And these bonds um, are kind of like an IOU. Big financial institutions buy them and the Government of Canada has to pay them back plus interest at the end of the term. Well, the term is up for a lot of this debt that was taken on during the pandemic, um, as we're seeing right here. And they're having to refinance this debt at far higher rates um, today, meaning that their payments, the amount of um, tax revenue that like is collected from Canadians, a higher percentage of that will now be going to just servicing the debt, paying the interest on the debt. So I think that's pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, and you, you're right. I, the, the, the provinces are a big part of this too with, with the amount of debt that the country's in in total. Yeah, but it is like paying Visa with a MasterCard, but there's really is no other option at this point. Like you're not going to be able to cut spending by $508 billion um, and then get back to, to a, a uh, to back to even, right? So this is what you have to do in the short term. The conservative government would be doing the exact same thing here, I think. Maybe they would have, this number would be a little bit lower um, if they cut a lot of public service to, and, a lot, and some programs that they, they thought were unnecessary. They, they, that number might be a little bit lower, but regardless, even if it was a conservative government right now, they'd have to refinance this debt because what else are you going to do? There's no way to raise that amount of money. It's wild. Unless, like maybe you sell public assets, sell airports to private investment groups to get even, but then it's like a cost benefit of is that actually worth it um, versus just taking on the debt. So I thought that, that was pretty interesting as well, but it's concerning to me that a higher portion of tax revenue isn't going towards actual programs that Canadians need but it's going to servicing the debt, right? So I think that's pretty wild. Uh, uh, uh. So good stuff, bad stuff. As you can see here, and I'll, I'll, I'll full screen this now. As you can see here, this is a mammoth document. 410 out of 430. There's 430 pages in here. I'm going to be taking a look at it over the next um, next week or so, hopefully coming up with videos when I find things that are interesting in here and impactful for you. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. There's a lot of people who watch this channel and aren't subscribed. Do my best to try to hit that uh, 100,000 in sometime in the next year. That would be pretty cool, uh, a long-term goal. So I appreciate the support there. Uh, so let's take a, a look here. Um, we're not gonna go into the individual sections, but I wanna take you back to the table of contents so you can get an idea on like, okay, what is in here, what's interesting, and and you can let me know if there's anything specific we want to take a look at um, in the short term here. Let me zoom in actually a little bit and maybe I can even uh, slide this over <laughs> so you can see it. All right, so we've got an economic and fiscal overview, some explanations the labor market is delivering higher wages. Mm. This is something that the Bank of Canada is actually worried about, right? Uh, higher wages for Canadians. Um, they're worried about that being an inflationary pressure, even though inflation has far outpaced wages. They say if we don't actually see a, um, a productivity growth along with those wage growth, that it could lead to a, a wage price spiral, which is something that they're scared of. Canadian economic outlook, private sector economists expect a soft landing. We'll see if that remains to be the case if we actually do see the population growth drop off that we're expecting. Um, uh, one thing that I've said on the channel a lot is that hey, maybe the fact that we raised interest rates so much and we didn't see the economic downturn that we all expected, 
like why did that happen? I think it's because of this human stimulus, the addition of a million plus Canadians uh, a year over the past couple of years has resulted in uh, propped up GDP. Will we still get a soft landing if we reduce the growth rate from 1.2 million a year to 300, which is the projection right now, what the government's targeting? I don't know if we're going to continue to see a soft landing, um, but we'll see. All right, fiscal anchor, keeping debt to GDP, not debt to GDP per capita, though. A bunch here on building more homes, a lot of the stuff we've talked about from the home plan or the the housing plan that was released a couple of days ago. All right. Making it easier to own or rent a home. Aligning immigration with housing capacity. That could be interesting. Let's bookmark that, 63. Um, yeah, because they're really trying to lower immigration now, um, or they say they are. We'll, we'll see what actually happens. I think there's a lot of lobbying that's going on by certain individuals to try to keep population growth high. Um, but we'll see. Credit for paying rent. This is increasing your credit score if you make rent payments on time. No real details on how that'll be implemented uh, as of yet. Maybe it's inside of here, but I think that it could actually give more power to landlords because if you're uh, allowing landlords to make uh, sort of claims that affect your credit, then maybe that could be a negative thing. I I'm not sure. 30-year uh, amortizations, we talked about that at the top of the video. A demand-inducing measure, right, could drive prices up. Like, I think the government says time and time again, buy real estate, buy real estate, buy real estate, not with their words, but with their policies. Uh, and that's why we have a big productivity issue in Canada is because that's been the message for so long, and it's been one that has worked for so long, right? Cracking down on short-term rentals, no more Airbnbs. That's actually not what that's doing, but, um, yeah, they, they took the tax you can't write off illegal expenses for illegal short-term rentals. Um, that's what I believe that is. Um, okay, lifting up every generation. Pharmacare plan, that's for diabetes meds and contraception. Canada dental care plan, that's already going on. Something that the NDP really heavily lobby for, but probably won't get a lot of credit. Like, I, like, <laughs> I don't understand the NDP strategy because they say, hey, we're doing so much because we're pressuring the government to make these changes. But when those changes actually come in, nobody listened to the NDP saying that, that like this is happening because of us. The liberal government who actually bring forward the legislation to implement it, even if it was a result of them making a deal with the NDP, are just gonna they're gonna be the ones to take credit for it, right? So I really don't understand where the the that party is headed and what their thought process is behind that strategy. Okay, expanding the disability supports deduction. So maybe tax deductions for folks with disabilities. I always like to see help for, for people um, with disabilities. It, it can be a, a challenge. It's, like, it's a challenge for anyone with the cost of living th these days, but even more so for people who are struggling with disabilities. So that's something that I think is a good thing. Best start for every child, national school food program. A, a good idea in principle. I'm interested to see what the implementation of it is um how much funding actually ends up in in the bellies of, of kids versus um the administration of it. it would be interesting to check out we already know about the affordable child care um coding skills for kids that's good mm -mm -mm. rent support for students i haven't heard about that what the deal is there A stronger Canadian pension plan. Oh, that is interesting. That's one I want to jump to right away. How many people watching this caught the video on the channel talking about risking the Canadian retirement fund? Um, the, the idea is that the government of Canada was trying to make it so that the Canada pension fund, OMERS, which is the, uh, large, one of the largest public sector pension plans, um, and the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, a bunch of the big pension plans in the country, forcing them to invest more in Canadian companies. Um, controversial because that's our that's Canadian citizens retirement funds and if Canadian companies aren't the best um, aren't the best investment in terms of return then is that risking our retirement funds um, because Canadian businesses aren't as successful and aren't as as profitable that's something I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go there maybe right now I, okay well I'll, I'll keep reading this and I'll come back to that where even yeah stronger Canada pension plan um, stuff for farmers, stabilizing the cost of groceries. That could be interesting. 
cheaper internet home phone and cell phone plans. I'll believe that when I see it with <laughs> the government connections to the duopoly of Bell and Rogers. But um, airline fee, transparency. Okay, so you just need to show us <laughs> that we're getting fucked. Um, I, I, I honestly wish that that um, non-Canadian airlines could do intra-Canada flights. It's cheaper. It's it's more expensive to fly like like from Toronto to to Quebec City or Montreal than it is to like go to California <laughs> on a flight from Toronto um, because there's not competition for the intra Canada routes. Um, it, it's not allowed. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Okay, boosting research, a lot of AI stuff. I, I'm curious to see how much of that is just lip service to try to make them sound like they're a forward-thinking government. Like, I compare this to uh, to the liberal government's thoughts around uh, crypto as an industry. Like, there is a lot of speculation, a lot of fraud, a lot of, um, of scams in crypto. But I, I'm a personally a big fan of the industry and what it can do. Um, over the long run and it just isn't taken seriously by a lot of canadians a lot of average canadian citizens i think don't like um don't like crypto just because of the way that it's treated in the news and and some maybe uh, less than accurate assumptions that they make about it um but i i like there to be competition for the fiat money system i think it'll make like a competition in all areas makes things better so if there's a competing financial system different financial rails it makes the big banks have to compete better and it ends up with better results for consumers so um that that's one thing that i like so they pick and choose their technological things that they want to support and that they don't want to support i think it's largely not picked by them but picked by what they believe average canadians are going to think um yeah, you can check this out. Just Google, uh, yeah, for people looking for this document, Google um, Canada Budget 2024 um, document, and that'll bring you to a page where you can find this PDF, or you can view it on the website as well. Okay, so more money to EV <laughs> manufacturers, um, attracting investment for the net zero economy. Yeah, that, that's too long of a of subject for me to get into right now. Uh, let's keep going. Growing businesses investing in Canadian startups. I like the sound of that. Safer health or com- healthier communities. Combating hate. This is, could be a controversial one. Where's the line between hate and, and free speech? And that's a huge topic these days. Cracking down on auto theft. Okay. I know there's a lot in here. I apologize if I'm not getting to a, an area that's particularly important for you. Um, again, you can find this document online, uh, 2024 budget, and you can take a closer look yourself or stay tuned and subscribe to the channel because I'll be coming out with videos on some of the stuff that I think is most uh, interesting in here. All right. A bunch of defense spending increases. That could be uh, that could be interesting. Mm-mm. Tax fairness, yeah, here's what we already covered with the, with the increased capital gains. Yeah, James, great question. James Lucas asks, does this still need to be voted on or has it passed? None of this is actually real yet. <laughs> That's the wild thing about the budget. People take it as if it's truth, but I don't think even the government themselves take this as, a, as truth. Like sometimes they'll have something in a budget that sounds great to somebody and then it doesn't actually get legislation written um, addressing it for years and years and years, right? Um, a lot of this is virtue signaling of what they want to do. And then uh, when it comes to what they, what they do, that's a whole different story. Um, I think what they do is more determined by what they think will get them the most votes the quickest. So... Um, yeah, none of this is a guaranteed thing. We got to see how these individual policy ideas are implemented and legislated or passed through the House of Commons via bills. Um, so that's interesting. Expand. Oh, here's some maybe some anti-crypto stuff and expanding tax transparency to crypto assets. What does that even mean? All right. Okay, and we get to the end of it there. Okay, just because my mind's on it, I want to see what this is. 
Oh, great. More, more talk of just the uh, risks. Just as crypto assets pose financial risk to middle-class Canadians, the rapid growth of crypto asset markets pose significant risks of tax evasion. Why is that? You have to report capital gains on any on any crypto earnings just as you do any other stocks or investments. Regulation in the international exchange of tax information must keep pace with tax evasion threats. New reporting framework for crypto transactions. Um, the government's intention to implement OECD agreed crypto asset reporting framework. Uh, so what does this even mean? Common reporting standard effective at 26 to permit exchanges under the new and amending reporting requirements. Oh, so it seems like they're saying international ex or something like international exchanges have to provide more details. Okay, that, that's interesting. I mean, I think that most people in crypto pay, pay their taxes. Maybe that's naive of me, but I know I do. <laughs> okay. So I want to go back to that pension plan one, and then we will probably get into maybe one more, two more things, uh, take a couple questions, and then you're going to have to keep posted for um, what else comes of this. Uh, let's see. Stronger pension, that I think was the key word. Isn't that what it was? A stronger Canada pension plan? Where was that? Strengthening. Where am I missing this? I'm losing it, you guys. Let me see. Pension. Ah, there it is. Key ongoing actions. So, a stronger Canadian pension plan. Canada's public pension plans um, give people the confidence that they'll be able to retire. For people under 30 right now, or maybe even under 40, I'd say plan on supporting your own retirement and then treat Canada Pension Plan as a bonus or any pension that you're entitled to as a bonus. Wait, you hear that? Very faint. Oh no, I have it turned down on you. Uh, it's, okay, yeah, they're just replaying the budget speech. Let me close that up. Confidence that they'll be able to retire in dignity. Um, they got to keep up with inflation. Pension plan. Do, 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 do. Providing, it, providing an average of more. Yes, okay, got it. Okay, so they're adjusting them all to keep up with inflation, meaning these pension plans need to do even better. Federal government and provincial partners regularly review it. Federal government, in coordination with provincial partners, proposed to make technical amendments to the CPP legislation, top up to the death benefit, partial children's benefit for part-time students, eligibility for the disabled contributors' children's benefit, and eligibility for survivor pension plans. Okay, so these are all positive things for individuals. Um, I was expecting to see stuff about um, where they were forcing uh, pension plans to invest. Bigger benefits for seniors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's just saying this is ongoing. This already happened. They already increased OAS pension by 10%. For seniors 75 years of age and older, this was controversial at the time because it split seniors up into two different categories, like senior junior and senior senior, 65 to 74 and 75 plus. Um, so that was controversial that it wasn't going to, to everybody. Um, I think ultimately they'll probably continue to raise the retirement age as it becomes more and more challenging for pension um, plans to actually make good on their promise. Mm -mm. Okay, is there any more on long-term care? Let me see if there's more on pension plans that we've missed here because International comparisons, net debt share of economy. Maybe they bailed on it. This was supposed to be in the budget, but I think a lot of people were frustrated. Oh, no, it's right here. Encouraging pension plan, pension funds to invest in Canada. Okay, so this is all the preamble. What's the actual change? It's right here. 
Budget 2024 announces that the government, working with pension plans, will create a working group led by Stephen Polos. This is the guy before Tiff Macklem, that was the governor of the Bank of Canada, um, the guy right after David Doge that we heard listened to at the very beginning of this uh, two-hour approximately stream, um, supported by Freeland to explore how to use more of our CPP funds for investment opportunities in Canada. Um, okay, so this is just an announcement of an announcement of something that might happen over a very long time, right? There's a lot of announcements that happen in budgets that are like... Um, we're announcing that we have the intention of creating a panel to uh, to review studies from different stakeholders to see what we might want to do. So I think that this is like a soft commitment to trying to look at this kind of stuff. Yeah, this government loves AI all of a sudden. Uh, investment in airport facilities, that's something that's interesting because that's what pension plans want. They want their hands on um, airports, actual cash flowing assets, things that actually have an uh, operating income for which they can um, recapture their investment over a period of time. VC investments, I would actually be in favor of this um, to a certain extent. If pension funds had more venture capital, like more risky investing in small scale entrepreneurs, like a small amount of money for a small team of people, I think can eventually lead to outsized gains um, for the Canadian economy, for those individuals, those companies. I think it, I, I, I support this, at least on surface level. To support investments in airport facilities, they'll release a policy statement this summer highlighting flexibilities under the governance models. Okay. Okay. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. Okay. Any um, a, a, any burning questions? Burning things that you want me to look at here or just in general uh, questions as we sort of uh, start to wind things down here. Probably have another 10 minutes here in the stream that we'll go over this and... Uh, but I appreciate all of you for being here. Uh, if you haven't yet commented in the chat, let me know that you're here. It's good to see all your names and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Um, I appreciate all of the support from everybody who watches these videos and I'm glad that it seems like uh, they help people to a certain extent. I'm going to search for bail-in. Does not appear anywhere in the document. Thanks for the conspiracy. You covered it well, Russell Top Notch. I appreciate it. When do they generally vote for this stuff right away? Eric Zimmer, great question. Um, usually what they do here is they'll vote on the uh, the ways and means motion, which is the, the budget. They'll vote on the budget in general. Um, it's kind of just like a ceremonial vote. Uh, it doesn't actually make anything happen. It just It just signals the views of the different politicians on this budget not actually making anything go into effect, right? So it doesn't really do anything. It's just a ceremonial vote. Um, the real things that happen is that, okay, the government has told the public this is what they want to do. Now they got to they gotta start putting up, right? Putting out a little bit. Is that the right term? I think maybe that's, uh, maybe I'll get canceled for that. The government's got to start putting out. Oh, man. They, they got to start doing things and, and, and putting forward legislation. And uh, that's the stuff that gets voted on and actually becomes reality, becomes a law. It goes through the House of Commons first, second, third reading, and then to the Senate, um, uh, goes to committees, and then it gets confirmed. Okay, we've got Xavier here saying, what's the difference between crypto and going back to bartering? Uncertainty and value makes it inefficient as a currency going back to rock versus gold versus silver versus flowers. I don't think that's the case. I don't think the that's the I think I think crypto is very like I agree with, with what you're saying. You can't just trade unlike assets for each other. It makes it far less liquid. But why is that any different than than fiat? Right? Crypto, I, I think there will be sort of more accepted general um, digital assets that people might transact in. Um, I think that I'll largely power digital commerce over the long term. I don't know about real goods. I don't see people like having a digital wallet and going going to uh, like somebody's place on Facebook Marketplace and paying them in crypto or USDC or something like that. Uh, I don't think it's bartering though because there's still this interim thing that has value, um, be it Bitcoin, Ethereum, or, or whatever. Uh, and that's the thing that is the divisible, um, divisible payment method, I guess. I, I know what you mean though.
Okay. Yeah, Alan Madsen, thanks so much. Says love the content. Thanks for the stream. Thanks for the stream. Appreciate you tuning in. Bob says, how long does this process usually take? For the passing of this, probably the next three or four days it'll get passed. Um, but the, for the actual stuff to come into play, to actually happen, year plus, probably a lot of the stuff doesn't happen until right around the election time where they can say, hey, if you don't vote for us, you're not going to get this thing that you want. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful. Well, I appreciate you all tuning in. This has been a, uh, a great stream. I, I think that there's a lot of good in this budget, uh, more so than I was actually expecting. Some things that I, I'm questioning, right? Things that drive up demand in the real estate market while they're trying to uh, make things more affordable. It can make it easier for people to buy, but they've got to take on more debt and, and helping them to take on more debt. Is that really helping the, the housing crisis? It's like a Band-Aid solution in my mind. Uh, so that, that's one thing I'm concerned about the impacts of that. The, one of the biggest things that capital gains change for, um, people who are experiencing over a $250,000 capital gain in a single calendar year doesn't, it's not going to apply to most Canadians yeah, usually, but I think it'll largely apply to people who have rental properties and have had rental properties for decades. Some people might be frustrated there saying, Hey, I bought this expecting the rules to be this. And now you've kind of rugged me, kind of changed it on the fly. Uh, pulled the rug out from under me. So some people might be frustrated about that. It'll be interesting to see if we see uh, more rental properties and cottages sold and listed right before this is implemented. Again, we don't know when it will, if it will ever be implemented, but that could happen or it could encourage people to hold these things for the long run um, uh, rather than uh, selling them at all, right? And taking out debt, um, to, like, borrowing against that as uh, collateral. Um, and getting that tax-free money that is the loan that you can get with a house as collateral. So who knows what we're going to see. Uh, I am Smiley, primary residence, no capital gains on primary residence. That's something that the conservatives will like to say. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. The liberals are going to do this. I don't think the liberals ever will do it, uh, honestly. Um, but it's kind of a boogeyman for, for people saying that they're going to do this. Um, they made the statement here very clearly, that will not happen. That will not happen. Um, whether you believe it or not, it's up to you. But um, they definitely would be going back on their word in a big way if they were to add that type of thing. And it doesn't look like it's happening in the short term. Um, but yeah, lots going on in this budget. Like I said, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. I appreciate you all uh, tuning in. It's great to see you all here. I, I feel like I get to know you a little bit better and maybe you get to know me a little bit better on these live streams because it's not as edited and sort of cut together it, this is just how I am um, and I think now I'm gonna grab some Chick-fil-A grab a beer and I'm gonna go watch the Leafs game and hope that Sheldon Keefe plays Austin Matthews in this game so he can get his 70th goal that would be huge so into it. And thank you very much, uh, Brian Pereira, uh, $2 uh, of a super chat. Appreciate it. Uh, all that support is much appreciated. Would love a vid doing a deep dive into the AI stuff. I'll have to take a look at that. I, yeah, I'd be interested in that as well. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind. I thanks so much again, Brian. And thanks so much to all of you. Hope you have a great rest of your night and I'll, uh, I'll catch you next time. Have a good evening, you guys. Um, yeah. See you later.